Hearts and minds clear this morning. Thank you all for uh, all that was said. Um, I don't know who needed to hear all of those. Somebody did. And um, I appreciate it. And, and I know other people here appreciate it. Um, and, <laughs> you know, it's it's... It's amazing how God works and weaves and does things and, you know, oh man, uh, we, we can't even, we can't even, um, you know, to, to, the message I had lined up for today, I mean, it's, um, I, I'm still going to uh, share some of it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to abbreviate it a little bit because... I, I think most of the preaching has already been done in the last few minutes. But the what I wanted to tie in at the end of my message goes along with what you have been testifying about this morning. And so we're, we're going to read through this. And um, you know, this, this passage of Scripture, uh, this is another question we had. And I'm, I'm trying to wrap up Revelation. And... Um, this was the question. Uh, Revelation 10 talks about the little book. I don't understand. And, and if you read Revelation 10, it's, 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 you know, like a lot of Revelation, there's things in it that are just, they're hard to understand. So, you know, uh, whoever sent the question, don't worry about it uh, if you didn't quite understand all of it because a lot of us don't because it's a hard, hard book to understand. But turn with me to Revelation 10. Because I think the, end, the ending of this and, and the challenge at the end of it ties in with what you've been saying. Because in, in actuality, that's kind of what this, this chapter is, is all about. Um, this, this chapter, uh, I, I know it's the, it's the King James Version that uses the word little book. Um, better tra the other translations uh, use scroll. Scroll is a better translation here, so it would be the little scroll. Um, that that is seen here, but this is this is part of an interlude uh, in between the sixth and seventh trumpets, and you will see uh, like just like in between the sixth and seventh seal, there was an interlude, and you will find that here as well. Uh, this interlude um, before the seventh trumpet, and this is talking about uh, we've been talking about uh, in in weeks past of God's wrath on mankind, His that it's going to come, but His wrath is available to the unbelievers. And, you know, so much of when we read Revelation, I think we get caught up in the doom and gloom and we don't see the hope and the light that's there. And sometimes we don't see the work that we're supposed to be doing. We, we gloss over things. And I think that's with a lot of Scripture, but especially with Revelation, because, you know, we just want to get to the good parts. But there's, there's good in all of Revelation. If you're a Christian, there's good in all of it because it shows us that there's work that we need to be doing and that there is a portion of God's creation that is going to suffer His wrath. You know, and, and keep this in mind. As human beings, we were all made in God's image. He created us that way. And so as people who've come to the light, people who've uh, gotten saved, and we've accepted Christ as our Savior, our Lord, our Master for life, for our eternity, we've accepted that. But there's something yet that we must be doing, and we've been failing to do that. You know, I'm, I'm very thankful that there's a resurgence and people starting to realize this and say, Oh, wait a minute, me and, me and Dwayne was just talking about this this morning. And I've talked about it before. We've talked about it in Bible study many, many times. What is it that we come to church for? Is it come to sit in the pews? Is that the only reason we come? It shouldn't be. But so many people do. The majority of people who come to church on any given Sunday, that's their goal is to come and sit. You can't do that. That's not what Christ has called us to do. And that's not what church is supposed to be. He has called us to serve. We come here to worship Him. And worship is that serving. 
That is, that is how we worship. We start with serving and coming in the door. God, what can I give today? What can I give of myself? And, and part of that is action. Yes, we can speak. That's part of it. Testimony is part of it. But what is the other part? It's being the hands and feet. The actionable part. And I think this, in, in part, this is what chapter 10 is telling us. So we're going to go through this. And I'm going to condense it a little bit and get to the point. John sees this. He gets this message. says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. And his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. So just let me provide a little context. Revelation is full of symbolism. Now maybe John is seeing a, a, a great big individual putting his foot on land and sea. This is symbolism talking about the authority over all. And you can trace it back to ancient Greece when they built the Colossal of Rhodes, which was uh, I think was 105 feet, and built it with one foot on land and one foot on water. And that was their intent. Was to show that they were masters of land and sea. So some symbolism here that this is saying that this, this little scroll, this mighty angel that has come down... This is not Christ, that this, uh, this angel here, this is not Christ. Because Christ is not just another, and that's, that's what it said there, another angel. Christ is more than another. So this is a special angel come down to deliver this important message to John. And he's speaking on the authority of Jesus himself. That this word has authority over land and sea, over all of creation. In the verse 3 it says, And he called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, it was about to write. I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Now, at the beginning of Revelation, John was told to write all this down. Now he's told, now don't write this part down. There's a time when that part will be revealed. Remember Daniel, he was also given a message. Write this down. You've seen it. Now seal it up because people ain't ready for it. So here we have this message, this, this voice, these seven thunders, they spoke. And a lot of times, if you trace that back in the Bible, a lot of times when God showed up and there was thunder, there was speaking. And so this is always associated with God's voice. And so there was powerful authority spoken of something that was going to happen. And as you get farther into Revelation, you know, just like we've had an interlude between the 6th and 7th seal, and now the 6th and 7th trumpet, guess what? When we get to the bowls of wrath, guess what? There is no interlude. Because what God is bringing is coming. And so God here, this, this is another type of warning, I think, for unbelievers, for people who would read this. And so He said, don't write this part down. It's going, it's going to come to pass, so don't worry about that. We know that. But it says, and the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his hand, his right hand to heaven. And swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay. So uh, in, in what uh, God is showing John here, he's telling him that the time is coming. That there's going to be a time where this delay is no more. And I'm going to bring what I said I was going to bring. You know, and then for a lot of people who, who go to church, a lot of times this stuff scares them. It shouldn't scare you. It should encourage you. Because if you're saved, if you're covered by the blood, God has got your back. And we forget that. We forget that He's got our back. He's got all sides. We ain't got to worry. 
There might be trials, tribulations, rough seas, strong winds. We might face all of that. But He's got our back. He's got our eternity. That's why we don't worry. He said there would be no more delay. Verse 7. But in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel. Have y'all heard a seventh trumpet yet? I ain't. So it ain't happened yet. But buckle up. It's coming. But in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants the prophets. And so as you go back and read the prophets, and that's one, that was one of the sections in our Bible study that I really enjoyed probably the most is because the minor prophets are so overlooked. And, and when we talk about minor prophets, they're not minor by any means. But there's so many powerful prophecies in these, in these small texts that tell us what is to come, that tell us what God is going to do, and it tells us about His kingdom. And what a mighty kingdom it is, but it tells us that there will be these great things that happen. And we see these things take place in Revelation. So here He's saying that this mystery, this mystery of God, one day will be fulfilled. Just like He told His prophets. And folks, that ought to encourage us. Because that means things is wrapping up. That means God has got eternity right there at, the, at our doorstep. We're waiting to be in it. This is wonderful. Our eternity. Not eternity of condemnation, but a, an eternity of bliss, of being in the presence of Jesus Christ Himself. Amen? But see, in, in this moment of encouragement, there's something here, not only for believers, but for unbelievers. And it's something that believers must do. So pay attention. He said here in verse 8, He said, Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel, who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. Now there's a couple of things with this right here. This kind of echoes back to what happened to Ezekiel. Ezekiel was also given a scroll and told to eat it. And there was also some bitterness on his part. Now, taking this scroll and eating it, we can only speculate what was written on the scroll. We know that has something to do with the end times. But the fact that he said, here, take and eat it, it's, it's sweet. Sweet as honey. You know, David echoed something similar. And every time this, this is used, it's talking about the Word of God and how sweet it is. How, how when we ingest it, it is so sweet. The Word of God is so pleasant. You know, and for believers, when we read the Word of God, it, it should be sweet. Sweet as honey. Like, you know, just the, the, the best thing we've ever eaten. But you know, sometimes people hear the Word of God, it might taste a little good, but man, it turns sour on them because they see the consequences. And I think sometimes this is, this is the message for unbelievers. Yeah, it sounds nice to hear the Gospel. What about putting it in action? What about changing my life? Oh, that's turning my stomach. It don't feel good. I don't like it. But as believers, that's the message we got to give them because you know, at one time, we heard it. It's like, man, that sounds good. But now you've got to give your life to Christ. Oh, that don't sound good. Because now I'm not my master anymore. See, it's, it's, it's giving authority over who we need to give authority to. And, and as unbelievers, unbelievers don't like the fact that, yeah, I, I can tolerate this message, maybe I can hear it, but putting it into practice in my life and knowing that I've got to recognize that someone is greater than me, someone has authority over me, and I've got to give that over, I just don't like that, I don't accept it, so now it's bitter. I've been there, I know that. 
it tasted sweet and then turned bitter. So there's, there's two things working here. We can also say that as Christians, when we read the Word of God, yes, it is sweet as honey, but there should be, there's something else here. We know how the end of the story goes, right? We know who wins. But what does it do to us knowing that there are people who are not going to go with us? It's bittersweet. Our heart burdens and our heart hurts to know that there are people who are not going to enjoy the eternity that we are. So when we read these words, sometimes it is very, very sweet, and then we take it and it's like, oh, but Lord, what about them? And see, here's the problem. So many times, a lot of us, we will say, you know what, somebody else can do this. Somebody else, hands and feet, can do this. God says, no, it's you. And it's me. He didn't leave these tasks to one person. He, lay, he left these tasks, this responsibility, He left them to people who believed in Him, who accepted His Word, who accepted Him as Savior. He's left that to us, the church. That is our responsibility to share with unbelievers the sweetness that is God's Word. And so there is a bitterness when we know that people will not go with us. And I always like the, 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 I wish I could remember it word for word, so I'll paraphrase it here. But it was from Charles Spurgeon. And he made the comment that we ought to be out there evangelizing and telling people about what is coming. About their, their eternal future. And he said, if people must go to hell, then let, let us trip over them. Because we have tried to help them. Now if you read it in the entire context, it makes much more, much more sense. But he's saying that we didn't just leave them to somebody else's devices, but that we spoke to them. We preached to them. That is what we must do. We're not responsible for every outcome, but we are responsible for sharing. And it's not just about testimony. As important as that is, it's also about action. And the two go together. They fit hand in glove. James said, faith without works is dead. We can talk the talk, but we must also walk the walk. And John here, after doing this, Verse 11, he said, And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples, nations, and languages, and kings. And there's something about Bible prophecy, or something about the Bible in itself, that any time the number four is used, the number four represents the world. And so he's, he's telling John, he said, Look, even though I'm telling you how it all ends, I've showed you how it's all going to work out, how I'm going to bring forth my kingdom. He said, you must still go out and prophesy to the world. That message was written for you too. It was written for me as well. We have a job that we must go out There's a word there that says must. In the Greek language, you don't know how strong that is. That is a command. You must. And he tells us that same command. We must go out. And tell the world. Again. Command. Not a suggestion. Not a preference. Not if we feel like it. But we must. And as Dwayne was talking about. And some others I heard. Sometimes you know it's very difficult. 
to be able to do that. You know, we, we get a little uh, scared or a little fearful. And as in Bible study this week, one of my favorite passages said, you know, God didn't give us a spirit of fear. If he gave us, you know, if he didn't, if he didn't give us a spirit of fear, then who did? We know who did. That's right, Satan. And so who are you listening to today? Whose commands are you following? Because if you're fearful, then you're not following God's commands. You're following somebody else's. And you may not even realize it. But he tells us that God didn't give us that, but he did give us something else. He said he gives us power. Do you understand what I'm saying? He gave us power. That Holy Spirit power. It's not our power. We have no power. It's His power. He gave us that. And he, not only to give us power, He gave us love. And He gave us self-confidence. He gave us those things. So what are you going to do? He gave us a command to do those things. Are you going to do them? What part are you going to play? Are you going to pay lip service? Or are you actually going to do the job at hand? Now we know the outcome, right? We've already discussed. We know the outcome. Who wins? Jesus. Remember last week when I say Jesus, you say. Who wins? Amen. So here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. Knowing the outcome doesn't change our mission to tell the world who they need. The world can do without us. It can't do without Jesus. And that's who we need to be telling and showing the good news that Jesus saves. Let's stand for a closing prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you today for uh, such a, a just such a blessed service, and and thank you for. Uh, such a beautiful spirit here this morning, and uh, it's so encouraging to see uh, so many people uh, just share testimony or uh, just just be able to share something. And uh, uh, Lord, I know somebody needed to hear it. And and, and Father, thank you for um, the the song that you placed in my heart uh, for somebody this morning. I, I don't know who you know who they are. And um, Lord, I just wanted to be obedient. And Lord, I I, I do pray that uh, whoever that was for. Um, I just pray, Lord, that their, their heart is touched today and that they feel blessed and that they feel loved. And, uh, and Lord, uh, I just ask for all the people here, Lord, uh, just, um, you know, I've heard this exercise before that sometimes we um, just ask, ask each person here. Uh, and I, I pray that you would put it on their heart today, Lord. That to pray for the, the first person that comes to mind, go. Whoever that person was that you just thought of, that, that very first person, without putting much thought into it, pray for that person today. Pray for that person right now. Because God speaks to us and He reveals things to us that maybe we didn't see before. And so Lord, I pray that whoever here, whatever thought they have, that they pray right now for that person, Lord, and I'm lifting whoever, I'm praying for everybody here. We all need it. I'm praying for my brothers and sisters right now, Lord, that they would be uplifted today. Lord, that, the, that your power would overtake them. And Lord, that they, they, they would see the light. Lord, maybe they feel a little darkness. Maybe they're stumbling a little bit. But Lord, maybe right now, Lord, they would see you 
out of all the darkness. And it would pull them out of the funk that they're in. This rut that they might be in right now. Lord, it might be healing or uh, something emotional, mental, uh, whatever. Lord, I pray today that there is that breakthrough and that they see you. And Lord, just so that they will know. Well, that all of us will know that you are with us no matter what. And so, Lord, I, I lift up each person here today and again, just thank you. Thank you for your word and how sweet it is. But Lord, let us carry out your mission. Regardless of what, how we know the end is, that should encourage us to go out even more and to share your word and your hope. Lord, and I, I, I lift this up in the name of Jesus, the name above all names, and it's in Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.